I'd like to start by welcoming you all to this online conversation on reclaiming the role of black women in activism in the UK. Thanks to the support from the National Heritage Fund, Alternative Fictions has been invited by Newington Green Meeting House to organise this online discussion. Women of colour have made significant contributions to British society, yet when we come to learn about the makeup of British history, their experiences and contributions tend to appear overshadowed when compared against others, or they're told for them by others, and in many cases, they're simply just left out. In this discussion, we want to celebrate the work that black women in activism have done, both past and present, and we will also discuss some of the reasoning behind why their names are often left unknown. Joining us today, we have three brilliant speakers, Stella Dadzi, Keza Rose and Ife Thompson, three black women that have made significant contributions to British society through the activism that they have done and continue to do. Stella is a published writer, historian, educator and activist. She's best known for her book, The Heart of the Race, co-written by Beverly Bryan and Suzanne Scaife, that serves as a powerful corrective version of Britain's history from which black women have long been excluded. Her new book, A Kick in the Belly, published by Verso Books, will be coming out at the end of October. Stella is also a founder member of OAD and her impressive career as an activist, artist and educator spans over 40 years. Keza is COO at AZ Magazine and is a creative producer, artistic director, activist filmmaker and arts council changemaker. She uses her creative practices to give marginalised groups a voice. She is also the creator of Family Dinner, a sober day event focusing on QTI BPOC wellbeing. She is also the co-creator of Campbell X of QTI BPOC Family, an intergenerational event centering QTI BPOC with DJs, film, performance and community participation. Ife Thompson is a UK-based community activist, barrister and writer that campaigns for the rights of people of African descent in the UK. She has founded two civil society organisations, BLAM, which is an award-winning non-profit that provides education, advocacy and wellbeing support for black people living in Britain, and also Black Protest Legal Support UK, which is a hub of UK-based lawyers that provides pro bono support for BLM activists. So we're going to go into into the discussion now. Um, and we wanted to begin by looking at the ways in which black women organize and engage socially and politically, both past and present. So I'd like to start off by asking Stella, with your work as a historian, you've been documenting and uncovering the stories of black women through colonial times into the 70s and beyond. Much of these narratives are unknown to the wider British audience. Um, so we wanted to, to begin by asking you to share with us some of the ways in which black women are engage were engaging in activism in the UK over these years. Okay, thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, I think what I'd like to do, Sam, is go back a little bit further because, um, as you mentioned, I'm just about to publish a new book called A Kick in the Belly. And one of the things I was doing as I was writing it, of course, was researching into ways in which black women have resisted long before uh, 70s and 80s in the UK. And I think that's a good starting point for us because it really is a reminder that even Coffer Line, in the Barracoons, um, in those ships that took us across the Middle Passage and on the plantations and beyond, there are numerous, often unsung and invisible black women who resisted in all, not just in the sort of traditional, stereotypical male, taking up arms, burning the fields kind of way, but also through subtle and um, overt forms of resistance, some of which relied specifically on their gender and um, their unique as women and I think that's a really important reminder for us today particularly in these extraordinary times because um, it's a reminder that we have a long long history of activism we didn't always call it that but certainly of, of, of women who have stood up and fought back um, in terms of our agenda um, in the 70s and the 80s um, I think it's important to um, explain why black women found it necessary to organize independently of others in their community. 
um, many of us had experiences within organizations like Black Power Movement and um, other what I like to refer to as UK civil rights organizations. Um, we always talk about American civil rights, but we actually fail to acknowledge that there was a civil rights struggle here too. And many of the black women certainly that I knew were coming out of that context. They were tired of being minute takers and coffee makers. They were tired of those. They were tired of male dominated agendas and um, in a in a very sort of nutshell kind of way, because I for hours about this, what it meant was that we found the need to come together and focus on the issues that particularly affected us, but in a context that was grounded in our local communities. And I think that's what made us unique. Um, it certainly um, case that when we were looking at what was happening, for example in the emerging white women's movement it's really important to remember that it was very very early days for white women too in terms of organizing or, or current fem feminism as we understand it um, certainly when we looked at what was happening on that front um, there was a perception i'm not sure it was always a valid perception but certainly a feeling that that, that the white women's movement was dominated by middle class women who to some extent were involved, we thought, in a bit of navel gazing. Certainly there was a perception of, of, of them being anti-men. Um, I think there was a fair understanding that um, a lot of the issues that were being taken up by the white women's movement weren't really addressing the nuances or the particular concerns that black women um, had. So um, that and the fact that we thought it was a luxury to be able to just focus on ourselves. They talk today about intersectionality, but actually um, our organising always came from a position of understanding that our struggle was located in the struggle against racism and also located in context as well, which was about recognising our economic status, not just here, but globally. And I think the other thing that made us unique and that um, uh, gave us a particular edge was that many of us wanted to organize in a way that kept one closely focused on what was happening in our countries of origin. Um, you're talking about the 70s, there were a lot of anti-colonial struggles, liberation, not just in Africa, but across the world. And there were also, um, influences that came from that direction, Pan-Africanism, the women who were fighting for their liberation within um, African liberation struggles, who influenced our thinking and who reminded us that what we were experiencing here was connected with stuff that was going on overseas. And I think, um, to answer your question, um, you know, we were engaging in an activism that was very particular and peculiar to us because of all those factors although and even some people probably might argue against this although many of us did see ourselves as feminism feminists um there was definitely a, that we were black feminists some people rejected the term altogether we were still grappling with those ideas and trying to work out what feminism actually meant and whether it was relevant to us i certainly never had any problem with the term um, but I know that some black women prefer the term womanist, you know, uh, um, what was it Alex said, um, feminism is to womanism as um, lavender is to purple. I kind of like that. Um, so, yeah, we were all grappling with the term and grappling with what it meant to be a, a feminist or an activist. But certainly those are some of the issues that brought us together at that time. Um, I, it's great what you've said because you've actually followed on very well into my question that I really wanted to follow in, which was why some of the reasons black women had to go outside of these pre-existing spaces to build something else. So it's great that you've touched on, on quite a lot of that. Um, so I, I'd quite like to bring Keza into, into the discussion now, just because it's evident that women already contend with issues that combine racism, misogyny, and for many class as well. 
And this is something that's also played quite a significant role in adding to further invisibility when it comes to these narratives and why they tend not to be heard. Um, but for queer and trans women of color, there's further discrimination based around the need to also contend with homophobia and transphobia. Uh, and so even less is known about these sorts of narratives. So I just wanted to follow by asking you, Keza, two questions. Uh, what issues have queer and trans women of color had to deal with in terms of safety and well-being, but also what are the consequences, what are the consequences of these two things adding to their narratives being unheard? Um, well, thanks for your questions. They are definitely really uh, insightful and it's really important that we first talk about uh, black trans women and uh, trans women of color uh, because those women, especially black trans women, aren't safe in communities. It's not just one or two or any other, it's communities, multiple. And also some of the men that date them um, because a lot of these men uh, don't want their family or their friends or their colleagues to know that they're dating a woman they love but this woman is trans and so they get confused and they think, oh, am I gay? And, you know, trans women are women. So it's a, it's a, a man and woman relationship. So of course they're not gay, but then they haven't explored that part of themselves and they're not ready to. So this is one of the reasons why a lot of uh, trans women, um, you know, are attacked and, and often killed and not supported within the LGBTQI plus community. Funny enough, you would think that uh, these women would find um, a place of safety within a community that is so marginalized, but quite often it's not the case. And so that's one of the reasons why I created Allies Corner, not just for black trans women, but for trans people in general, so that we can have these conversations with actual trans people. And the host of that is uh, Kimberly and she is a black trans woman and it's important for me as a cis woman to make space and take a step back and if I'm talking about trans people and I'm including trans people then I have to have trans leadership within what I'm doing and so that's why spaces like that are important because I have massive privilege within a space where there are trans people suffering or trans people generally and so bringing everybody together we're in a space to have these conversations from actual trans people about what they need what makes them feel safe what services they use and how we can be better allies and so kim does a lot of that work as a black trans woman to bring other black trans women and other trans people to the forefront so that we can have those really important conversations um, and i forgot your other question so please do remind me <laughs> Um, so my other question was, what are some of the consequences uh, of this adding to these narratives being unheard? The consequences are sometimes very difficult to tell. Um, I think that we're not really having the conversations, especially when it comes uh, to cis and trans people, because a lot of people um, probably would have heard of cancel culture and so are terrified to have those conversations. Um, and being a queer black woman myself, um, I, I, I'm not ashamed of my sexuality, my gender or anything else, but a lot of people are. And so a lot of these conversations aren't happening in communities because people are afraid. People are afraid to be attacked. People are afraid to lose their families. People are afraid to be shamed. And also I think along the way we've lost those intergenerational conversations as well and so it all impacts on us in a way where we're not learning we're not doing things um, as a kind of follow-on from people before us because there have always been trans people this is not new trans people haven't just appeared out of nowhere and dropped from the sky trans people have always existed but it hasn't really been very well documented or hasn't been passed on for whatever reason. And so, yeah, we're, we're losing out on um, parts of our rich history. We're losing out on learning about ourselves, learning about others. And we're losing out on supporting people who we probably would want to support if we knew how to support them. So yeah, there are many different ways that um, uh, we're kind of losing out, but also 
those of us who are doing this work, um, we get a lot of abuse. And so often I find that it is black women, whether they be trans women or other types of women who are at the forefront, who are um, suffering abuse, whether it be a black trans woman or women like Diane Abbott, like there are black women being abused all the time and uh, not enough done to safeguard us. I hope that answers your question. No, it definitely does. Um, what I think would be just quite nice is just if you and Stella, just reflecting on what it, Stella you've said and also what Casey's been said, do you have any sort of just observations between yourselves and stuff that you'd want to, because we would love this to try and try and make this a dialogue between you guys as well, just to, yeah, to try and get this sort of communication happening on what's been discussed so far. And then I am going to move on to, if we, I'd like for you to speak, speak a bit about uh, structural discrimination. So just... Well, I feel that I've spoken, so I'm very happy for Ife to kick off. Okay, brilliant. But well, let's go for that and then we'll go into a bit of a discussion between the three of you. So looking back over the years, uh, so it seems in some ways that many things have changed whether it be legislation, I mean, for example, we have the introduction of the hate crime legislation in 1986, but discrimination is also something that has been embedded in many of the structures that impact our everyday lives. And this is something that also contributes heavily to why the stories of black women who are engaged in activism in the UK tend to be overlooked. Um, so if it would be great for you, if it would be great for us if you could start off by giving us your perspective on areas where you feel that you've seen progress when it comes to structural discrimination, but also areas where you feel there's still much work that needs to be done if we're going to refocus and reclaim the role of black women in activism in the UK? Um, I think that question puts me in a difficult position because I think it's easy to reflect and say, oh, things have gotten better and things have changed slightly, but if the problem is still there, then we still need, there's still these things to be done. So I feel like I'd be doing a disservice to those in our community that are still having to suffer because of structural racism by suggesting that, oh yeah, things have gotten better. Um, I think that there's a lot to be done. I think that's a, that's a fair, fair way to put things. Um, I think also what we tend to happen is that we're in a space where with social media, tokenism is taking over on a grand scale. So we see Black as and, and, and Black excellence being our like to go point. Like if we see some sort of Black exceptionalism, you know, Black people excelling or Black women excelling, you know, you've got Black girl magic um, excelling in the space. Oh, it, it, even though we've been put in such difficult circumstances, we still manage to succeed. And that's like the go-to is like, you know, being able to just just do your best and be the best even though it's harmful because you shouldn't have to be competing and doing more to, to be able to survive in society. And what we see is this idea of black people having to be exceptional. So I think because we see tokenism exception is becoming the norm, black women are putting themselves under, you know, a lot of strain to be excellent. And, you know, if I just work extra hard and if I just do this and do that, then I'll be accepted. I feel like a lot of black women have to be perfect, have to be um, amazing to, to, to in order to negate this uh, guard we, we see statistics saying that in terms of people that are most penalized um it's black people so in terms of uh, um, and you know the speech tribe you know you're more like the same the, um, the legal question of the same Sam, I'm thing, getting a break. Even though we get into these spaces, I hear what you're saying, Ife. I couldn't well, figure out if that was me or her that was talking so about. I know there's that in that regard. In terms of all organizing to so if they put space in the Caribbean, I don't know. Or If it, I think we're just having a small technical difficulty, so we should be, hopefully we'll be reconnected again in a second. So, sorry, I guess this is something that does happen quite often with uh, 
Zoom and yeah, online online sort of webinars. Um, have we got her back yet? It says she's still connected. Yeah. Um, but I don't know whether she can hear us or not. Um, okay, she's back. Hello. <laughs> My internet Hi. cut off. No, no it's sentence. <laughs> so, but we actually back. lost quite a lot of what you said, so I'm really sorry, but it'd be great to have you um, sort of start again. Yeah, okay, okay. so I was um, mentioning about um, in the UK when looking at the activism spaces, you know, you have sister space at the moment, which is um, London's only African and Caribbean um, domestic violence charity. And um, they raise a lot of issues, particularly there's a really, really good video that's going around with the founder and Gosley talking about, you know, can you see me? Can you hear me? I'm a black woman. And she was kind to explain to everyone that when black women go to police services, you know, the fact that for black women, we have brothers we have fathers and in terms of how the police treat our um family members you know it, the, we see a lot of police violence we know that they are disproportionate stops and search so for black women if they are um experiencing domestic violence um they would be very reluctant to go to the police service but that's the only service available for them to go to so in terms of having like in terms of those in power having that intersectional knowledge to know that for black women police have never been a safe space for them to go to historically and even now so i think in terms of having policies that are that they, they, they are said to be um, colorblind, but in, in, in the fact that they're colorblind is actually oppressive to black women. So I think, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot to go. And I think on, unless our, we have a seat at the table and we're able to actually actively express our issues and not only express them, but be in a position of power to actually actively do something, then we see the same cycles, you know, happening over and over again. So I think in terms of uh, what is happening in our communities at the moment? I think we need to have a seat at the table. I think you know other things that come to my mind as well when thinking about black women, practically in the in the world as well. Um, our hair is an is an issue. I mean, 15th of September was World Afro Day, and um, if you go on the World Afro Day website, um, it's a, a day endorsed by the UN, and they found did a hair equality report, and they were talking a lot about um, you know for black people in general, but black women in particular. Um, the fact that, you know, we are getting fired from our jobs because of our hair. You know, in New York, they, they passed the Crown Act, which is, it makes it illegal to have hair discrimination. You know, even though in the UK we have impressive equality um, rights and equality law frameworks, we still see black women being discriminated and black people being discriminated, even though we have the ex um, impressive frameworks. So I think in terms of having much more concise legislation, something like the Crown Act in the UK. I think that will be something that I would look forward to. Um, but I also think the spaces that we're operating in, there needs to be more of a culture of anti-racism. I think this as matter movement has brought it to the forefront, but I'm just also mindful that within um, the Black Struggle Movement, instead of talks about this in, in their book, Heart of Race, quite a lot, um, the issues about the Black community are always focused on the men. So in terms of issues affecting Black women, it's not necessarily at the forefront. So, you know, I think in terms of going forward when people are picking up anti-racism work um, and books, you know, on the black experience and things like that, they need to factor in the fact that the black woman's experience is part of the black experience as well. So I think when we have people unlearning and, and understanding what it means to be anti-racist and including the narratives of black women, then I think things will get better for black women as a whole. Thank you for, for that. I mean, I think something that we've we've discussed a lot in between ourselves as well is that I guess we sometimes we feel that we've progressed in terms of maybe there is less, less racism, but it's still there. It hasn't gone away. And it's just sometimes it's a bit more invisible. And sometimes this is another thing that's contributing to restricting us and restricting why our stories aren't often, they're still hidden. So... Mm. It's interesting um, that you say, um, and that people have been saying that there's less racism. I would like to see where, where, where the evidence is for that, because um, if we look at um, institutional racism, for instance, and we look, look at the McPherson report that says that the police are institutionally racist, I would love to see where it says 
what the police have done in the last 20 years since Stephen Lawrence sadly was murdered, um, what has happened where this sudden change has taken place over the last 20 years or before, where, whenever the change happened. I would argue that racists have been told they're not allowed to call us the N-word. They're not allowed to t attack us because they may go to prison or they may lose their jobs. And the rise of social media, of course, is where people call people out. They'll, they'll find somebody online. Somebody will be um, you know, trolling somebody. Uh, they'll be doing something racist online. And a lot of the time on people's Facebooks, they put where they work. And so people just contact their employers. And so uh, racists have become, have moved with the times. You know, they may not tell you what they think, but you might find that you don't get promoted. They might not tell you what you think, but they might, you know, put something in your food. You know, you just never know. And so if we're moving back to what Ife said, is that I'd like to know, A, when this sudden change happened, um, when we suddenly, you know, got less racism, and B, um, just, just a thought of, like, where are Black women safe? Other than around other Black women, and even then, we're conditioned not to trust each other, that one of us is going to do something to one up from the other. And so that's also part of social conditioning, you know? So I'd, yeah, I'd love to know, A, <laughs> when, um, you know, we've got less racism and, and B, you know, where are black women safe? Because I, I would argue that, we, that it hasn't changed. It's just changed with the times in terms of there's not less racism and B, uh, I don't feel safe most of the time apart from other black women. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I've always sort of worked with the concept of the anti-racist racist <laughs> in the sense that there are people who language and as you say, they've learned how to uh, police what they say and uh, how they express themselves. But I think we do need to make a distinction between the tweaks around the edges that we see and the gesture politics that we see a lot of and actual fundamental change and I really did have quite an issue with Black Lives Matter matters only in the sense that all of our attention has been focused on crimes against black people in the global north um, and that's in no way to undermine the severity of the or indeed the legitimacy of challenging and calling out those who are um, responsible for them but the lives of a black child living in, you know, some ghetto in Lagos who dies of a preventable disease um, and the lives of women who are being transported across the Sahara Desert or who have opted to travel, make themselves um, in order to escape poverty, violence, deprivation. Those lives matter too. And I suppose um, when I talked earlier about OAD um, trying to keep one eye on what was happening in our countries of origin and making the link mm. is, an important, is an important thing to, for us to do today as it ever was. Mm -hmm. And in that context, I agree with you, Casey. I don't see that a racism has in any way gone away. And the fact that perhaps, you know, Vogue magazine is featuring more, mag uh, more articles about black women and their hair and how they like to dress. That to me is just, um, it's window dressing. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually doesn't in any way address fundamental issues that keep us down. Absolutely. Because even when we talk about police brutality, or we talk about all the other atrocities that are, are committed against black people um, in this day and age, um, what we have to do is to recognize the economic, the socioeconomic context of that, the, uh, the, legacies, uh, the legacies of colonialism, the legacies of enslavement, all of those things that, that feed into our experience today. And I know that within the feminist movement, there's a very useful debate um, being um, had between people who describe themselves feminists and those who describe themselves as radical feminists think yeah. I've got that right mm -hmm. and I suppose in a nutshell the argument is that a few more women in the boardroom or a few more women's faces on TV doesn't actually necessarily make the lot of the majority of women in any way better no. and in fact quite often um, people who get sucked into um, 
those positions, those more visible positions or those positions of leadership, um, they have to, to some extent, sell their soul in order to survive in the context. Our current Home Secretary is a perfect example. I said it, you know, um, shuff pulling up the drawbridge despite her own family's migratory history. It is a disgrace. And so I think we need to be very, very careful as black women, that we don't think that just because a few black women have got into parliament or a yep. few black women are on this board, room, board, whatever, or have a chief executive role, that that somehow fundamentally changes the severe and deep inequalities that exist globally and that continue to exist. And actually I think will be exacerbated as a result of COVID-19. Mm-hmm. It's very, very easy to get complacent. I don't care whether personally, whether Vogue magazine features issues around my hair. Yeah. Um, I think it's great that it's being discussed and no way, you know, that's not important, Ife. But that to me is not really um, cutting the mustard, you know, that there has to be a fundamental re-evaluation of the privilege right. that w- those of us who live in this, in this society have vis-a-vis the people who we've left behind in our countries of origin. And until that inequality is addressed, I think, you know, um, we're in danger of somehow things have gone away. Uh-huh. Yeah, I would um, echo that, Stella. Um, for me in particular, I mean, I'm with you on the whole notion of actually us connecting back home and seeing what activism needs to be done there. I think we can become so centered on the western world we even forget what's going on back home and actually the, the things that are happening back home are as, as effects of colonization and imperialism and i think there's a big disconnect and, and they want it like that i feel like they knew how important it was you know in the 70s and 80s to have that you know you had the third world book fair you had that you know global sort of pan-african reach which we don't see now even though we've got so much technology at our forefront it seems like, you know, things have gone backwards, which doesn't make any sense. Um, the comment that I was just making was like it's for black women and black children that are excluded from school or fired from work for wearing their natural hair, which is part of their cultural heritage. That's obviously a problem deeply rooted in racism and the idea that professionalism is linked to whiteness. So that was the only regard. But I mean, I could care less about Vogue as well. I mean, it's more about structural, fundamental and radical change. I concur with you both. I have nothing else to add. <laughs> they said what they it's said. It's like going much of a discussion, isn't it? We all agree on everything. <laughs> I think, I think, but I think it, it's really interesting that, um, I, I mean, I was raised in a Rasta household. And um, for those that don't know, it means that I was, um, blackness was at the forefront of, of everything that we do. And we're talking about, you know, um, our, our places of origin. And so for me, it's like really refreshing when I'm on a panel and I'm hearing about, you know, talking about our countries of origin, talking about where we originally came from and having that be the focus. Because, of course, um, you know, structural racism and all of these things that we're having to deal with in the West, it, it's important. However, it is a distraction from, um, from what our real work is. And if we're constantly being distracted, which, by the way, is also systemic so that they can continue to plunder. But, you know, that's a whole different panel. Um, yeah, you know, the real work can't happen. And so, yeah, like, like I was saying, it's, uh, yeah, it's really refreshing to, to hear this. I think just to move on from everything that you're saying, because you're all coming together, especially talking about, uh, you're touching a lot on the lack of uh, visibility, but also uh, how these issues that were faced by marginalized people sustain further inequalities. And also we started to kind of touch briefly on sort of the need for decolonizing as well, but there's also need to look, especially in the UK, just towards the education system and the role it plays in all of this, because it's um, it's really guilty for, firstly, for making sure that all of these narratives, the narratives of black women in activism, the narratives of people of color in general are missing. They are, it's not the history that you're taught. I did history at university and I honestly struggled so much because it wasn't the history that I had grown up knowing about. It was very different. And so you, all three of you work very much as educators. So it'd be great to know a bit 
about some of the things that you do to help rectify this and also some of your thoughts and hopes on to how we can change this. I was raised in, in an environment where I had uh, a private tutor and I had to go to African studies, African dance classes, African cultural events and all kinds of things. And so I went to mainstream school, but then I also had a private tutor and had to go to all these different events and spaces. And so my mother, you know, she, at the time I thought it was a punishment. I was like, but I want to go with my friends, it's not fair. But now I'm like, oh my goodness, my mother was radical for her time. My mother made sure that I understood my blackness in its truest, uh, rawest sense. And so I think, well, I have two sons, I have twins and they are 23. And they also have had that same um, education away from mainstream education, because if you're in the West and the West took us away from where we came from, then why would they give us the tools to get back and um, realize our power? They're not going to do that. Um, so we have to make sure that as black people, that we are making it our business, that our children, our nephews, our nieces, our families, people that we care about who are black, understand that that system is not there to educate you. That system is there to condition you and to um, you know, close your mind to what you really are and who you really are about. And so for me, it's really important that you look outside of the mainstream system and do your own research, speak to your own people, and also connect with your elders because we've lost that as well. Those intergenerational conversations are not there um, for no reason, it's passed down. And so our way of documenting things wasn't really, I mean, of course we wrote things and we made uh, great art and there are stories in the cloth and so forth, that's, that's there. But our elders are the key to the knowledge and um, we need to, yeah, have those intergener intergenerational conversations. They are of paramount importance and should be protected at all costs. Yeah, I wanted to say something about that. I, I mean, when you were talking about your education, um, Kay, it, it just uh, made me smile because of course, black women were at the forefront of the development of the supplementary school movement. Um, Saturday schools, supplementary schools were very much a response the debates uh, that were initiated by Bernard Coward back in the late 60s when he wrote a book called How the, Black, How the West Indian Child <clears throat> is Made Educationally Subnormal Within the British School System. It's a huge title for a book, but it, it, it sparked a debate and very much um, enabled us to focus on what schools were and were not doing. And I've always felt that there's a tension because I've worked within the education system life um, as, as well as supporting those initiatives that supplement the education that is not given and ensure that our children are, are given a rounded education that includes a sense of themselves, their culture, their achievements. I also think it's really important to fight from within the system so that the way you do schools, Kay, as not catering for us or just conditioning us is actually challenged and changed. Now, um, you know, if I think back in my own career, I started, I was only the first black teacher in the school that I, I started my education career in, in Haringey. Um, and immediately I became a magnet for black children um, because, you know, they were attracted to someone who spoke their language and who understood their context. So the case for more black teachers in schools, and I'm not saying that all black teachers are necessarily on our side because something often people get into those positions. But those who remember where they came from and who understand that you never forget the influence of a good teacher, uh, it's really important that they continue to engage with the education system and don't just create something separatist because that to me smacks of apartheid. As you know, what you see in schools as, as, as from, from my observation anyway, is that, you know, we're okay as dinner ladies and admin work, the odd teacher, but you don't see us as, as well represented on, in the staff room as you do in the classroom. So that issue of institutional racism still has to be challenged. There's also the issue of our invisibility in the curriculum. And I don't know about you, I'm tired of white history year. I really think it's important that we um, integrate these issues across the curriculum, not just in history, but in all subject areas. 
visibility isn't just about an historical presence, it's also about our achievements in maths, in drama, in art, in literature. And all of those things are about, I suppose, what is now referred to as decolonizing the curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's another issue which I've worked on. Sorry if I'm hogging, you must shout, shout at me if I, I, I do that, but I just wanted to make a few points. There's another issue, which is the failure to actually engage in a discussion about re what racism is and all that we've begun to talk about in the classroom. There's huge scope within subjects like PHSC and the curriculum and, and, and citizenship um, curriculum to actually engage kids in a debate about racism, to decondition those children who are raised in the proverbial white supremacist home or in, 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 in homes where these issues aren't discussed. And fourthly, I think there's an issue about teacher training because I, um, through my career, have met countless well-meaning white teachers and some very effective, powerful white teachers, but a lot of well-meaning people who are scared of these, who don't feel confident to address them in the classroom, who are worried about saying the wrong thing or using the wrong language. And you actually hear black kids saying, you know, I'm not the expert, yet the teacher's always asking me. That comes from a position of insecurity and there is no scope for that in a society as diverse as ours. You should be empowered to have these debates in the classroom with confidence and to understand that this is a two-way street, this dialogue. They need to listen to their kids, but they also need to have some authority in terms of pointing them to the histories and to the experiences that would enable children to up about whether racism is, is, is a useful way for our humanity to, to, to progress. Now, I could say more, but I'll end there because I, I don't take the conversation. But I think yeah. that's, that's, that's part of the debate about education, Sam. No, definitely. Um, and just on that, if I'd love to invite you to just talk a bit about what LAMB does because I'm sure a lot of what you do covers everything that we've yeah. been discussing, so it'd be good. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Yes, I think for me, I grew up in Brixton, um, of Yoruba and Nigerian heritage, Jamaican in particular. So I always say I became Jamaican by association. Um, and at school, um, I went to a majority black school, so all the students were black, majority Jamaican, I'd say, and maybe a few um, in the other parts of the Caribbean. Um, but we had no black teachers, and that's like around in 2001 to like. 2006. Yeah. If you are no, up, yes. not one black teacher in the whole school, and we all know we always hello. Okay, can, um, you, can you hear me now? Am I yeah. back? Yeah, you're back. Yeah, so I was just saying that there was literally no um, black teachers, even though the whole school was majority black, and we all noticed it. And, and one thing that always stood out to me is that even though I grew up in, in a very much a Yoruba home, you know, I, I knew a lot about the language, I could speak the language, I understood it very well, had a Yoruba name, which I really loved. So my name is Ife, Ife means love in Yoruba. Um, and the, my whole name is Ifeluapo, which means the love of God is a lot. And most names in Yoruba, in Yoruba culture are not gender specific. So you could be Ife boy, Ife girl. You know, I was very much proud of my culture in the, in the home. But in school, I was made to feel so ashamed of my culture, you know, particularly when um, students would, teachers, particularly white supply teachers would read out my name because they don't have any cultural capacity or competency. They would read out my whole full um, name not knowing that with uh, many and uh, almost all Yoruba names there's a shortened version um, so I was made to feel really embarrassed about my name embarrassed about my Africanness and also in in my class because everyone was Caribbean and there wasn't anything that was taught to them about African history there was a strong sense of Afrophobia they didn't like anything to do with Africa as well so it made me embarrassed about being African too and we always joke about on Twitter, but you know, we say in primary school, everyone was ca was Caribbean, and actually some of them were actually Nigerian, but pretending to be Caribbean because of this embarrassment of their history. Um, but what I would say is that in secondary school, I went to a secondary school in Tulls Hill, we had a black head teacher, Leslie Morris, and she was um, very pro-black. She had a program called the Guard Jam program, which was linking students in Jamaica and Ghana together, um, and the UK, like a, a triangle. We had majority black teachers um you know i really got to learn about um 
black history and black identity and black culture and that really changed my trajectory and my understanding of my blackness and that really helped me and I said to myself that you know going forward I don't want any other young people to go through what I had gone through and um, just after I finished uni I said that you know we, we wanted to create a space building on the tradition in the black community of um, supplementary school where we could teach black history to young people because we know it's not part of national curriculum we have black history month but what I also found um, when learning about black history it was just about slavery and nothing to do with pre-colonial Africa or about my Yoruba identity or anything to do with what made sense to me as a black person um, or as a, someone of African descent as well. So I just felt like that wasn't very useful. Um, so we set up BLAM, BLAM's Black Learning Achievement and Mental Health, um, started doing projects in our local community in Brixton with a lot of young people that came um, and were very, very much a youth-led organisation. So the young people told us you know, if we don't want to wait till summer to do this project, we want it in our schools all the time. I was like, okay then, let's see what we can do. So from about last year, um, September, we started going to schools, working with schools, delivering an after school program, teaching black history. Cause I said to the schools that we can't just come in and do one session on black history. That's not going to cut it. It has to be something over a long period of time. So we're doing that with primary schools and secondary schools. And what was one moment that I would re I really cherish is when I was teaching the young people um, about the Jamaican Maroons. Um, this is, I think they're about age eight. Yeah, around age eight, teaching them about the Jamaican Maroons and particularly teaching them about Queen Nanny and that how she's of Ghanaian heritage. And then all the, the class was majority, I think, Jamaican. And they said to me, so wait, all black people are from Africa. I said, yeah, they said, wow. I'm going to start saying I'm half African, half Jamaican. And they were so happy about it because we just, a few weeks back, we were learning about Mansa Musa, learning about medieval Africa, and they really liked learning about that as well. So when they knew that they were connected to Africa as well, it brought them so much joy. And I, it was such a um, cherishing moment for me that I wish I obviously had had myself, but I'm you know, honoured to be able to give the young people that sort of space now. Um, and then what we've also found is that during that as matter, a lot of schools have now taken up training to include, as what Stella was saying earlier, black narratives into all parts of the curriculum. So what we do is that we do a training for them called anti-racism training, but also incorporated black narratives into all parts of the curriculum. We, we say to them that it's not good enough to have black history, Mark, right? it's not good enough to restrict black history to just black history only when black Uh, if you are cutting out again, from in, in, you know, in, in all spheres, pieces are you know open and I'm so sorry, this is really annoying. I think, <laughs> am I back now? Yeah, yeah sorry about that. Um, I was just saying that what we've noticed now is that a lot of the teachers that we've been working with, um, they tend to be very white because the, the education system it has a lot of white teachers, as Stella was saying. Um, but what I would add is that. That a lot of them are realizing their bias. So we had a training just about two weeks ago, and we was a white head teacher who told us she's a female. Well, she said to us that a lot of black parents would tell her that um, she's being racist or she's acting on prejudice, and she would say to them, "No, no, no! Like we are just playing the race card." And she said, that since doing a lot of reading during the Black Lives Matter movement, she's actually realized that they were right. And actually, she was being racist. And actually, she feels so guilty because she's been in a position of power for so long. And she's even now assessing whether she should be in a position of power still because, you know, the fact that she wasn't culturally competent. So I think a lot more teachers, because of this, this movement, are becoming alert, becoming alive to their biases, to racial discriminatory patterns in the school system, and trying to see how they can, you know, buy resources on Black history, what they can do to learn about Black history. And I tell them in our in our sessions, our training sessions, that you have to do the reading. There's no two ways about it. I mean, I know I know that Black history and Black narratives are very much niche, um, but you have Black bookshops, you have places where you can learn Black history. And if you want to be a competent um, teacher, you know, someone that is teaching reflective of the students that you work with, you have to do the reading yourself. And I make it very clear. Um, and and they're, they're very receptive, which is quite good. So I think there has been a slight change in the public mood and public attitudes. Um, so I think that's really good. And also what I can say just to finalise as well is that we've noticed that during the lockdown because a lot of parents were teaching from home a lot of people were engaging with our online service so we provided an online black history forum for young 
um, people across the UK and we had about 500 students that signed up to it as well so they're doing a lot of African learning and Caribbean learning in their houses as well so we don't have to always rely on the school system which is traditionally what we've done before um, but also seeing what we can do to change things actively um, within the school setting and practically as well so that's kind of what we've been doing. Can I say something Ife because I just picked up on something you said that people have begun to engage with these issues and I think it's really important to acknowledge that people have been engaging with these issues since way back when. And, you know, the, the, the kind of training you talk about I was doing in the 80s, you know, and actually challenging those who turned that training into a guilt trip. They were literally training events where black, white people had to wear a badge saying, I'm in a racist, you know, go to the confessional and treated oh it like God. almost like it was therapy. Um, you know, that's not really what we need. But my point is that that work has since time there's some tremendously wonderful resources out there that go back to Ilia days and although I think it's really important to energy and the enthusiasm and the idealism of a younger generation who are being um, molded and, and shaped by the Black Lives Matters movement it's also really important that they stand on the shoulders of those who came before yeah. and that they understand that they don't need to reinvent the wheel yeah. And uh, pieces of work that I think is um, probably going to have to go to the top of uh, my list of things to do is to try to revive sources that are long since out of print, but are as relevant today as they ever mm -hmm. were. You know, I came across a, a, um, a pile of papers in my attic the other day, and they were literally a whole literacy course based on black writers. You know, James Baldwin, Maya Angelou, Toni Morrison, mm -hmm. the 80s, you know, mm -hmm. so that we could engage with unemployed black people in our community in Tottenham who wanted to get back into education, who education system had spoken to them or addressed their needs and who through that um, approach to learning, i.e. learning their literacy skills, learning to read and write and to become more competent in their communication skills, but in a way that they could relate to using writers and artists and people who actually spoke to their experience. That was a hugely important experience. And I can remember women who used to come on our courses say, I just want to learn to type. And they came and say, I'm going to be a rocket, uh, you know, an, an astronaut or a brain surgeon. And I'm going to, you know, leave my husband. And <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was great and it was empowering. So, um, yeah, I think my point is just, just, just remember that th th this, is, this is a long road that we're, we're walking and, you know, the journey began a long time ago. And part of, part of the thing that I have to struggle with, I'll be absolutely frank, we're having a free and frank discussion, is a degree of, I wouldn't quite call it cynicism, but nervousness around the sense that, you know, we have been here before. We didn't call it Black Lives Matters, we called it civil rights, we called it other things, but we have been here before. And we've also had this flurry of interest, yeah. flurry of uh, focus, you know, Scarman, McPherson, all of those milestones that we can yeah. look at through, through our history here in this country, Absolutely. which have focused people in particular on the inadequacy of the education system. Um, I've been involved in projects to look at black underachievement, where work with schools right across the country trying to look at what was happening in the classroom that was failing our kids trying to point out that we come from oral cultures and that where for example to use a stereotype a black boy is particularly vocal in class you use that you channel that energy you make him the person who does the feedback you use that kind of skill that goes beyond just saying oh i've read a few books about black history right that actually understands us culturally sufficiently to be able to respond to our needs. Mm -hmm. And you recognize that if you have um, what I would call a punitive response to kids that you can't control, then what you end up is throwing them out every Friday afternoon, they miss two hours or one hour of maths. And at the end of the year, you're wondering why they're failing in their maths exam. Mm -hmm. Kind of issue that I want to engage with as an educationalist, I'm tired a, you know a flurry around October where we look at you know great black achievers yeah the names that we know it's the names that we don't know that Absolutely. we need to be focusing on those group collective 
um, movements and organizations that we have we have managed to achieve yeah. despite not being acknowledged mm -hmm. and I think that it, it, it's a danger isn't it when when you look at black history about individuals who've you know yeah. invented the light bulb or who've done that who've done that yeah that's great that's fantastic Mary Seacole fantastic I want her statue <laughs> I want a recognition that yeah. it is the unnamed the yeah. individual people yeah. who actually create history and, and who make it's social it's make for social change and it's that message that I think is failing to get through when we have these debates about, you know, um, let's just tweet the curriculum. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting because, you know, places like the Forefront Project by Temi Mwale, I think is like kind of the modern day equivalent to act, an actual local person who is accessible to the young people, who is doing the work, who doesn't get as much recognition as I think she deserves, but she's not doing it for that. She's not a performative activist. She's not somebody that is doing something um, as an individual. She's doing it as a movement. And the young people are speaking. She, she always goes to the young people. To, it's led by the young people. Mm. And so, I mean, if, I, if we look back to, you know, the, the 80s and the 90s, we, 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 we've had that. You know, so Stella, you, you basically said everything that I was just like, that's why I was nodding, like, as in like, you know, like the Churchill dog, because I was like, yes, I was going to say, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And it, again, it goes back to those intergenerational conversation. It goes back to all of the work that we've done. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. But what's happening is because of the rise of social media and social currency, people want to get a blue tick. People want thousands of followers. People want endorsements from brands and things like that. And it actually becomes career activism and not about actual activism where you're making the change for groups of people, not centering yourself. And so I think that's kind of where we're losing our way. But like I, want, like I was saying before, people like Temi and others. It's not just Temi doing work. There's so many other people who people don't know about who aren't doing the work and uh, um, on television and don't want to do interviews. They just want to get on and do the work. Those are the people, you know, people um, who organize Sister Space, which was actually, you know, created out of a tragedy, you know, mm -hmm we need to know more about these community spaces. We need to know more about the people actually doing the work to benefit our future generations because um, it's actually quite scary what's happening with, with the rise of social media. Now it's great because we get to hear about so many people that we perhaps wouldn't have heard about before, but also like you were saying before, we can't afford to become complacent because of what we are seeing on social media. Oh, there's so much change. Oh yes, this is great. Look, all these brands have done a black square. Oh my gosh, they're all saying Black Lives Matter now. Yay, we've done the work, it's done. It's like, no, this is all uh, window dressing as you were saying before, and there's so much more work to do. And unfortunately, um, we don't ever really want to talk about how much work there is to do. It's not gonna you know, finish in my lifetime. I'm 40 next month. <laughs> I, you know, it will go well into my children and their children. You know, it's, it's a lifetime's work. And I think that that goes back into, again, intergenerational conversations. My children won't have to you know, reinvent it. They've seen the work that I've done. They've seen the work that community leaders that I've brought them around have done. And hopefully the young people coming up will continue the work rather than thinking that they have to you know start from the ground up i think you've all raised just incredibly important points through what you've been talking about especially sort of the resources that are already there there's the names that are already there but we don't some we sometimes don't know where to go looking for them and sometimes it's really difficult to access these uh this information so one of the last questions that we wanted to ask just before we open up the questions from, uh, we go to questions from the audience is sort of what are some of the ways in which we can start to make these resources more accessible? Because sometimes unless you're in an education setting, that might be the, and even in that setting, you aren't necessarily getting that at the moment, but we are pushing for that. But how do we push to making this a more open access? Like what are the ways in which you feel that we can strive to do, do more so that these stories stop being buried, that these stories are celebrated. It's quite Great a big films. <laughs> Great films. Like, that's part of why I got into filmmaking, like as one of my creative disciplines, was that I found that people are more likely to share videos or films or talk about those things. Um, and so that brought me into doing artivism rather than just saying I'm an activist and I'm doing all this stuff. Um, people generally 
are more likely to be receptive or more likely to take things in when things aren't spoken at them or where they're not feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm here because I know nothing and you're here to show me everything that I don't know and make me feel bad. Actually, entertainment uh, works and also um, sharing videos. Um, so yeah, I'd say um, filmmaking or creating some kind of art as um, a catalyst to um, you know, bring forth the conversations. Um, I suppose inevitably I'm going to say write books um, and I think it is important that we write both fiction and non-fiction and poetry and every other kind of uh, writing that you can imagine um, but I also think there's a role I suppose it's my age as well I'm going to be um, 69 in a couple of months I think it's really important that people of my generation who are involved in that struggle that we get some of that stuff down um, whether that means writing our autobiographies or whether it means looking back at the resources that are at the back of our and making sure that they go online because of course the technology that's available now was not available in the 70s and 80s and a lot of that stuff is just like in a handwritten form yeah. um, but I, um, I was talking actually I was doing a, a zoom conference earlier this week um, with women from the sisterhood and after which was um, an attempt to record the life stories of feminists um, by the British Library and that's the resource that people look at because there were quite a few black women involved in that project and our focus was discussing the real vital importance of oral history um, and I think you know in the context of some of the things both Ife and Keza have said about inter intergenerational discussions you can start by just turning on voice record and getting those stories down. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be elder people. We all have a story to tell. Mm -hmm. And those stories can be built upon and used, converted, as you say, into films, into drama, into any kind of, of, of media. But we do the work. And there's one other thing I want to say, and this may be quite controversial and it may sound a bit, I don't know what the opposite of ageist is, youngest. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, I am constantly shocked by the language that I hear in and hip hop and grime and other um, forms of, of, of musical entertainment. And I actually think that we can bleat on about racism all we like, but we need to put our own house in order, you know. I liked it when songs said something about something when they actually did talk about civil rights and wonderful achievements and didn't just involve shaking our booties and, 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 and you know, trying to big up this notion that actually is very, very much in the interest of white society to perpetuate, that we're all gangsters and pimps and, you know, that's all we're about. We need to change that narrative. We really need to change that narrative. And that's something we ourselves. I'm not saying that all artists buy into that. Of course, there are some wonderful people producing fantastic music. But I think that's something we ourselves can do. And there's so much learning that comes through that. If you're a young child of five, six, seven, and you're listening to music, I know from my own experience, you know, when I think about the music that formed me, it's Marvin Gaye saying, what's going on? You know, it's Bob Marley saying, you know, until the philosophy that holds one race inferior and another superior is finally and permanently discredited and abandoned, everywhere is war. Those are the lyrics that form consciousness or help to form my consciousness. And I would like to see our own black people taking that, banner up and making sure that the next generation's consciousness is formed in the same way. Get rid of all this booty shaking and knife wielding stuff and gun toting, but making music that actually says something about something. There, I've had my rant. <laughs> um, I'd say just to kind of, um, not even if it's a rebuttal, but just to kind of following on from Stella's point, that what I 
I mean, there are some artists, and I think we're doing a disservice if you don't mention them, that, that have been doing that kind of work. Yes, like I did Stormzy, say that. I did with, say that. Yeah, with, with Murky Books and, you know, all his entity. And in fact, he's got the Cambridge Scholarship. And even recently, he just launched a new project with um, Penguin just today about uh, trying to get more black writers for anyone aged 18 to 30 to write a book. And he's like, there's a lot of stories within the black community that are not being told. He wants, he's literally done a, a competition with Penguin because of that. So I think there are some, of course, uh, there needs to be more. And I, I always think back to Dave's performance uh, on, what was it? The, was it the Brit Awards? I think it was the Brit Awards. I think, yeah. And that was amazing. And that blew, like, you know, blew everyone away. So I think there are some artists doing the work. I, I mean, there's not enough, but I think even within the conversation about this, about drill and, and rap and, and um, music videos that are quite graphic and quite violent, I mean, some of them are reflecting their lived experiences, which is which is not great. I, they are living in very hostile, very dangerous environments that do need to be changed. And I think when young people are talking about, you know, these horrific things they're going through, we do need to see how we can support them, how we can change how we can change it for them because I think we live in such a capitalist society and everyone's mindset is about making money and getting out of the hood and they do see black people look like them a way in which they are getting outside of the hood and they don't have to be exceptionally good they can just you know sort of speak in their in their language that they're used to and in their environment they're used to is through music or through sports like I guess when all we've been drawn about is, you know, you need to make it, you need to become good, you need to, people don't really think about collective and it becomes very individualistic and they may be doing things that could be seen as harmful, but because they are desperate to escape poverty, you know, that's what's being done. So I think there's a class issue. I think there's, you know, those are issues that are within and I think obviously it would be, it would be great if we could have a variety of narratives, but we also have to be, remember that they are reflecting their lived experience which is not necessarily great as well so I just yeah, but reflecting lived experience and glorifying it are two different things mm. and i think you know someone you just posted i just saw somebody remind me about akala and loki i had the privilege of meeting and doing work with loki quite recently and um you know i would like to see loki up there in lights and all the others you know because he's saying something that needs to be heard um, and I'm not in any way trying to undermine the efforts of people who want to drag themselves out of poverty or indeed um, speak to their lived experience. That's not really what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is music that is con that, that involves consciousness raising, not just making us aware of our reality and endless talk, you know, stuff about life in the ghetto, but actually stuff that talks about how you survive and overcome the horrors of living you know in, in the way some people are, are forced to do i think so, um, forgive me if i sounded like i was dismissing those artists who are you trying didn't. i i absolutely love a color everything he says says you know is is on point and as i say i i think just from discussing with with loki um about his own a trajectory I know that those voices are not the voices that are lifted up and allowed to make the money they're not the people who are given the focus because those are the messages that are actually dangerous and which challenge the status quo in a way that all that stuff that I've referred to will never do they're so very transition from that to be in the ghetto you know and to glorify that ghetto life yeah I mean into a stereotype sorry Kaza it's it's okay and i think you you've both made um i've been nodding oh, by the way all along i th i think i agree with um some of your points but i think that it's important to remember that a lot of these artists especially the young people who are doing drill um that is their reality at the time mm -hmm. and they're very young and impressionable and i think if we start to look at people's careers as they start to take off they, a lot of them start to talk about different things. So they start off with the whole, you know, glorifying, you know, having sex with lots of women, and, you know, selling drugs and all kinds of things. Because at the time, it's not just their reality in terms of uh, lived experience, but the older people that they look up to are sending them to go and do that. The older people that they look up to, they're seeing them do this. And they think it's cool because they're too young to understand that you're the product of your environment. Once they start to see different things and have different experiences, you'll find that they write different lyrics and the message becomes different. But I think that as a black woman with sons, 
Um, of course, it's disappointing to see a lot of the young people creating lyrics like this, that it's terrifying to know that a lot of these young people, that is their reality and that is what they've chosen to speak about. And I think perhaps me personally, why I don't like to see it is because it hurts. I don't like to see my people speaking like this. I don't like to see that I feel a lot of these young people, they don't see a way out of this. And at the time they seem hopeless and it seems dark and it seems like we've got so much more work to do and we can't save everybody. And so for me, I guess I'm projecting when I'm like, oh, I hate that stuff. Oh, I don't want to hear it. Oh, why, are they, why do they have to write about these things? Well, actually, um, I don't feel like it's my place to, to police that. If that's what they are living and if that's what they've chosen to talk about, I just hope that they get to see different things so they can write a different story eventually. But um, yeah, I think it's it's very disturbing, some of the lyrics that I'm hearing. It's very disturbing uh, to know that, um, especially with my sons uh, being black and living in London, that they don't feel safe, that they feel like they can't go to certain areas because other uh, young people will ask them, where are you from? Why are you here? And it could be a very dangerous situation. So they have to, we have to take them in a car. They can't go on, well, with COVID, wouldn't allow them anyway, but you know, they can't go on trains, they can't go to certain areas. And I think that's a product of an, an environment that these young people did not create. They mm -hmm. just happen to live in it. And I think it's our jobs to do more. It's our jobs to connect them to more services. And it's our jobs to connect with more people who can connect with these young people. I think that's more of our task. If they are writing these lyrics, what are we doing? What are we doing to ensure that there are different narratives that they can write about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would echo all of that, and um, uh, what I would add as well, just to answer your question, Samantha, about um, mm. different avenues in terms of pre preserving our narratives. Um, yeah, I think I echo what everyone on the panel has said, particularly around writing. We did a panel on Blam um, a few months ago. We had Dr. Martin Glynn, who does a form of data verbalization. So he writes like essays, like you know, dissertations, and then he would literally speak over a beat. Um, kind of honouring the history and legacy of like oral histories um, and literally say the whole essay on a beat. Um, so I think things like that, being creative with, one, with stuff that we do in, even in academia, because he was saying that a lot of academics write narratives about like, the black community or about com communities in general, but um, academia is very removed from the community. So by him, you know, doing it on like a beat, he's trying to make it more accessible to people that he's writing about. So I think being more creative with how we disseminate information, I think that's one thing. I think, um, and they also mentioned him and Leila Hassan Howe, they were mentioning how, you know, back in their age and their day, when they were doing activism, there was no division of like creativity and activism. So when you were having an activism meeting, you'd have someone there doing like poetry, doing spoken word, doing dubstep. So they said like, you know, drawing back on those sort of things as well and merging creative art forms. And um, Dr. Martin Glynn made a really good point. He said one of the first people to react to George Floyd's killing were like the graffiti artists who like drew massive pictures of George Floyd and like, how, you know, art, is part of activism as well so kind of not forgetting that too and then they made mention that um a way in which they communicated a lot in that generation was through public and um, publication so like documents pamphlets yeah. documenting what they were thinking their thoughts and stuff you know writing books that was a, a real common medium so they were just saying that we need to kind of get back into the idea of publishing and not thinking it's so far removed from us and start writing stuff down start having a legacy and kind of keeping back on what was done in the past because even if stories may be lost if we have the stories in the first place we can still recapture them as long as they're already written we can always in the future refer back to them and include them in um you know in lessons and things that we're sharing information about but if we don't have it in the first place then we were in it we're kind of stuck isn't it so that's what i would just add definitely i think it's really great that you've you've finished on that because i think creative practices and it's like resonates a lot with what our collective does as well is that you have more access you are able to access more people because you're sharing knowledge in a different way it's still the same thing but it's easier to digest and it's not saying that you prioritize one over the other you still have it in multiple forms and that way different people can choose how they use it how they engage with it and you're just opening it up to to more people and then we solve we begin to solve this problem of a lot of these stories being invisible or hidden um but so on that we're just on that note we're going to just go to some of the questions that have been 
posted in the chat and so I'm going to read them more or less verbatim but um so this is a question for everyone uh in your ideal world how would you dismantle things like socio-economic inequality colonialism and imperialism uh if the way forward is not just getting women into positions of power is it about completely dismantling these positions and structures so i don't know who wants revolution to... <laughs> <laughs> what they did in cuba I mean, you know, it literally is like the whole um, abolish the police, abolish the system, yeah. wrap it and start again, because it, the system and also it, I want to make a point of saying that the system isn't broken. The system is working exactly the way that it was designed to work. The system was created when black people were slaves, you know, uh, the police were created to protect property. That was us. So I think yeah there has to be a completely new way of doing things or you know we're just going to come up with the same same things that we you know my mum was talking about when she was young and and other people's mums were talking about before that you know the system isn't broken so we need a whole new system i think um i agree that we need a complete overhaul i am no about the possibility of anarchy. I'm nervous about um, into the notion that somehow replacing white faces with black faces solves the problem. I think there are many people in South Africa today and in other parts around the world who will tell you that that is not the case. And um, I think we have to create some I, I agree with you that there have been experiments in the past in places like Cuba that have created a very different kind. Of, and there's a lot from the Cuban experience that I would um, support and draw from, but not all. And um, there are other countries around the world that have also tried. Um, you know, again, you can look at great writers like Nkrumah and um, Julius Nyerere, all of whom were talking about how we do this in the context of Africa, whether Pan-Africanism coming together as Africans was one solution and certainly um, an African socialism takes account of African culture and African ways of doing things. So all of those have to be thrown into the mix, but need to be throwing the baby out with the bathwater and I think we also have to really be mindful of the need to look outwards as well as in. I was having a discussion yesterday, it was about abolitionism, defunding the police and abolishing prisons. And my nervousness is around not only, okay, anybody who's ever been in a situation where they needed to call the police. And I, I absolutely acknowledge what you said earlier, Kaiser problematic that is sometimes but even in a context where it's problematic sometimes you have to do it I've also known moments of great relief when a copper stood on my door I don't want to throw that out I want people who are accountable and who do, who genuinely protect and serve I also agree that prisons are a great industrial military um, complex now and be basically a continuation of slavery I, I buy into all of that and understand certainly what Angela has been saying about prisons over time but I also know that if anybody tried to sexually abuse my grandson I would want that man or woman banged away and the key thrown away um, because while I recognize that some of these people are damaged by the very society that have created them um, I, I see that as a longer term project and we have to be careful not to just say I want to tear this down without actually having thought through what we want to replace it with. Um, I think that's, that's really the, the concern that I have. We can tear everything down. That is what revolution often involves. Mm -hmm. But it's much easier to be in opposition than it is to be involved in the process of, of reconstruction. And I think every revolution has, has, has shown that to be the case. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the question, um, I don't know the answer, but I think um, all of these things have to come. I certainly believe that unity is strength and that um, 
individual, what do we call it, identity politics, people treating into their own silos is not going to help our process and our, our ambitions and our dreams to be realised. I think that we have to stop um, shaming people, stop um, cancelling them, and uh, encourage people to have a debate across their show empathy and understanding towards people who don't necessarily get it the way we think that we do and begin to build our strength position of empathy and unity and community. I see far too much division and people themselves off and maybe that's just me. Um, uh, as I said earlier, I'm not a great social media uh, follower, so I'm not following all the debates, but I certainly think that there's a need for us to to really try to, to, to focus on the commonalities and come together across those if we are to achieve real social change. The last point I would make is that while we have our discussions here about sorry, defunding the police or abolishing the police, what we need to bear in mind is that there are many people out there um, in our countries of origin who are dealing with armed militias and mercenaries who don't even have nominal accountability to the people they're meant to represent or, 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 or to the state that they're meant to serve. So let's keep things in focus. Remember that, you know, it's not just about us. You know, we really do need to acknowledge what's happening in other parts of the world, which is far more desperate and mental, you know, in terms of basic needs. Um, what I would say is, yeah, I think a mixture of different, there's lots of things that we can draw on, but I do think, yeah, we do need to revisit and, as, as mentioned, I have shouted that revolution. I think that we need to change a, a whole change because the system is broken to its core. And the way in which I see things as well, particularly like around the conversations which have been had now about um, defunding the police and um, police um, prison abolition and things like that, it, loads of people will talk about the idea that it's going to be tomorrow we're going to abolish all prisons. Well, actually what we have now is a lot of people in prison for of, um, offenses that are not violent for offenses that they don't need to be in prison and it's a waste of taxpayers money yeah so it's like definitely gradual as well but there, there are some cases where people don't need to be in prison actually they can be in the community serving sentences you know they should be and and even with the prison that we have at the moment they're not prepared for their release date so it's like we've got people in a holding cell um, and then when they come out, they reoffend. So it's like, you know, even in terms of if, if, if we are going to keep the same system going, that still needs to be changed as well. I think the only way we can envision a sort of change is it has to be radical because we've had the um, McPherson report, we've had all the um, Scarma report, everything saying that we need to change the system and institutionally racist. And then we've been going through this era of police reforms and things are remaining the same. So we have to think outside the box because nothing has changed and like even for me I think obviously it's wonderful to have um, a system in place where everyone can feel safe when they call the police but I work when I was working as a youth worker we had young people that would call us when they were in danger or at risk of being stabbed and they couldn't call the police because the same police oppressed them so it's like of course the police are good for some people but we have to have it where it's good for everyone and, and until you know if one of us left out then we're all left out so I think Obviously, it's difficult to find the balance because some things will work for some and it won't work for others. But, you know, I, I want society to be inclusive and I want to have a, a society where young black boys feel like they have a space or someone that they can call to support them. And there, there's a lot of community groups that can provide them with support if they were given the funding. So I think in terms of when we are that we're talking about abolition, it's about actually bolstering up community capacity building, I would say, and actually giving communities the power to support um, us. Like, you know, a lot of mental health services, the police are the ones that are the first point of call. Um, I was recently at an inquest for Kevin Clark, who uh, died in police custody. Um, and we see, you know, so many cases, although Sandy Lewis, again, died at the hands of the police, you know, repressive state violence um, and you know, the police 
the police that were even called were saying that they're not really trained to be working with um, mental health patients. So if they are themselves not trained to be working with mental health patients and they are disproportionately killing black men who are having mental health crises, then we need to think about how we can get those that are trained mental health specialists to be the first point of call. So I just think it's about reimagining small things. I think it's not overnight we're going to be like this is going to be abolished because that would be con- total anarchy because no one will know what we're doing and no one will be prepared for that system. So I think obviously gradual change, but I think we've got to be thinking about the change how that can be radical and what steps we can be taking slowly and not within the tinkers of reform where the outside is being changed and everything remains the same. I mean, same with diversity and inclusion. There's no point in having black, black women or you know, people of colour in the space when the system is still the same and the system is still oppressive just because you're going to have black faces. So I think, yeah, I think definitely radical solutions. I think small steps and I think unified steps as well i think we shouldn't feel that we have to have the answers we should come together as a community and think of ways we can do things together we don't have to be the bearers of knowledge we all live in society together and think together we should be finding solutions um sitting down and think reimagining together but we it's okay for us to not all have the answers as well mm-hmm. so that's what i would say i just wanted to add that the police have been defunded like i think people like the whole idea of defunding the police like it's, i think it spins people's minds so i just wanted to just add that during austerity the police have been defunded and they can be defunded and and the money that was going to be put into the police that is being promised could be put, put into youth services could be put into places where if young people are involved in knife crime and want to escape because what happens right now is that a young person gets stabbed. They can't go to the police. If they do go to the police, the police put them back into the same area that they've been attacked in. So they'll be called a snitch, their pet, their family will be attacked. There's nowhere for these young people to go. So if we want to tackle knife crime, if we want to tackle all of these different things, there are ways to do it, but we need funding to be moved from a place that it's not serving all of the community and reshifted into areas where it can do the most impactful work. That is what defunding the police means. That is what we are talking about when we say defund the police. We're not talking about just having all of the criminals just out in the streets attacking people and hurting people. As if they said, you know, some people shouldn't even be in prison. Let them serve their communities in like cleaning parks and, you know, walking old ladies across the road, all kinds of things people could be doing. But instead they're in prison wasting money when they could be put to work in the community. There are so many different ways that we could reimagine what it could look like in our society and in our education system. Places like the Free Black Uni, started Mm -hmm. by a a really good friend of mine called Mel's. You know, there are so many different ways to reimagine what our futures could look like. But I think that's exactly what we need to do, reimagine. Not try to do things again and again and again and expect a different result because that's not going to happen. So finding different ways, even if they don't work, at least we tried. We can go on to something else. But yeah, absolutely. Defunding the police and uh, um, reinvesting in services that could actually do some good for communities is definitely one of the things I want to try. Yeah, and I, I agree. I don't really, I really don't want to give the impression that, um, you know, I don't un- acknowledge how difficult it is for some people to engage with the police. Part of what black women were doing back in the day was confronting police brutality, confronting state brutality, challenging the sus laws, all of those things that we still still, still see um, evidence of today. And I couldn't agree with Fay. I think community capacity building is absolutely fundamental. And a lot of my work in the past has been exactly, as you say, with youth services, trying to build from, un- from below, trying to empower young people to feel safe and to feel confident and to feel able to agency in their lives and that does start with with you know local community-based provision with local community people yeah. taking part in that absolutely um, absolutely fundamental um uh, requirements so yes i agree with you we, we we need to reimagine how it could be but i'm also very mindful that a lot of these things were reimagined a long time ago and here we still are so in answer to the person who asked that big question, you know, mm-hmm. how do we get rid of all this? How, what do we change? Um, I suppose I'm making a plea for us to, to not tinker around the edges, to have a coherency in our approach. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how easy that is with social media because there's so much scope for individualism. So 
to some extent you're ending up with you know a hundred where there could maybe just be five but certainly you know some some sense of unity singing from the same hymn hymn sheet or reading from the same page of the quran whatever metaphor you want to use Mm -hmm. those things have to be part of what we do because at the moment we're far too dispersed i think in terms of doing it and i hear you you know when you talk about the projects that are uh, 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 springing up and and um being run around the community but i i I was involved recently in in um a project with a group called Resourcing Racial Justice, and we had to look at applications from various community groups. What me was how much good work is going on around this country. There's some fantastic work that's going on. People with really good ideas and great energy and great commitment, but it's all in pockets. And I just like to see it all joined up a little bit. I don't know how, I don't have any answers, but it just seems to me that unity has always been our greatest strength. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left, so I'm just going to go through the questions. So we might have to, I know sometimes it's quite difficult to give these short, simple answers because they are very big questions, but we can just try and get through some of them. We might not be able to get through all. Um, so the next one we've got is... Uh, my friend ultimately said that to destroy problematic systems, we have to create a means for people who have participated in problematic systems to come forward. How do you feel about this? Is this kind of thing pos- is this kind of thinking possible in this climate? Yes. If he cares, oh Stella, would you like to expand? <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll pass on this it's possible I think yeah um, there is a so it's the same person who's actually posed the question and there's another question after which I think is quite good to follow on into this one so I'm interested in your thoughts of white, the white guilt phenomen- phenomenon that's so popular today there are books and courses dedicated to the white understanding and absorbing of this white guilt how do you feel about this is it a white person asking this? Because I can't see who's asking this. I would really love to know if a white person is asking this question, to be honest with you, before I answer you. I'm black. I'm black. Okay, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, your voice, I, believe you. <laughs> I don't I, I don't think that most white people do feel guilty. I think it's a performance. Um, I think that with social media and being bombarded with ways that perhaps they could have done things differently. Um, I don't think most white people really care. Um, Otherwise there'd be more change. But I do think there are some white people who absolutely didn't know um, what they were doing wrong or if anything even was wrong. I think this pandemic forcing us to kind of stop for a minute and not travel to work or not go on that holiday and actually be faced with something that could kill anybody has made some people for the first time in their lives notice what is actually happening to black people um and i think that that was a moment i don't think it's um something that would be here to stay because you know the black squares are gone generally people aren't really posting black lives matter anymore like that moment has passed for people so i think um the people that it was important to will make those changes and the people who were performing will continue performing about something else next week i don't know if that answers your question i think that guilt is fairly useless emotion and responsibility is actually the emotion or the response that I would hope for. But I also think we need to just get down off our moral high horse a little bit because actually, um, if we think about violence towards black people around the world, every time we pick up our mobile phones, we're responsible. Every time we buy cheap clothing in a cheap high street store we're responsible um there is all kinds of ways that violence is imposed on our communities around the world um that we unknowingly or knowingly buy into so um white guilt 
racism towards black people is only part of the discussion in my view. I think we all, black and white, need to take responsibility um, for the failure to value black lives around the world. That's a responsibility that we all have. Having said that, when it comes to white people who want to change, who want to change the narrative, or want to change their practice, we've never had more access to different ways to do that because we're all online, we can all access that, we can all Google stuff. We've got that facility. I, I say we're of us, the vast majority of us. So I guess it's about taking responsibility. And, um, you know, if you, if you haven't had that in life to date, then go out and look for it because it's out there. And there are copious groups and individuals who can help you with um, either your guilt or your desire to take responsibility for your own practice. For me, I feel like people always forget the key word and the key system of fighting against, which is white supremacy. I think, you know, a lot of new words are coming, white privilege, white guilt, but actually we're fighting against white supremacy as a global phenomenon. And I think when people understand that and understand the power structures that come with whiteness, and actually I see I saw a really good quote which said that whiteness is an ethnicity. No, it's a power structure masquerading as an ethnicity. It's all about power and access to power. And I think when white people start to understand, and it's uncomfortable, it will be uncomfortable because you have been accessing privilege and power just because of your skin color. And you will feel uncomfortable, but I think there's no point in remain, remaining uncomfortable and, and somewhat guilty and then just being like, oh, well, that's mm -hmm. just the way it is and you're just going to be moving on. I think the, the, the guilt comes in because you know that you're not going to do anything to change it. Instead, they were saying like, you're just going to be... Um, someone that's just taking part in the system and you you know it you know what's going on but you don't actively do anything to change it that's where you feel guilty so i feel like it's about people as you said actively changing but what in the in the space that they they find themselves in you know what can they do what if you're cutting out again sorry what can they be doing what you know, it's kind of thinking of I don't know is that um as recent white oh am I back yet? Uh so am I back now? Yes. Am I back now? Hello? Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, so um I've seen a lot by uh, about Robin D'Angelo and how like you know she has become the have of knowledge about racism like she's one of the best paid persons to talk about racism. Um even though racism affects the black community and black um, most, you know she's now making man be saying the same things but they'll be why we're more comfortable hearing it from a black person so we're still seeing the same power structures and systems of oppression being enacted so i just i mean i don't really have the answers but i just feel like people one is start listening more to black women citing black women more in their work that's one thing buying books from black women and i think yeah i think that that's just i think that's one thing but i think also just having an understanding of white supremacy and what you can be doing to unlearn white supremacy. I always say that black and brown people go through the same white supremacist system. So we internalize the same narratives about black people that white people learn about because that's what we're all under the same system. So like black people have to do, you have to sit down and unlearn Eurocentricity, start looking at more Afrocentricity, have a bit of a balance. So I just think actively unlearn white supremacy and all that it wanted to do. And that's a really big way of resisting. And when, you're, when you've unlearned a lot of things, your mindset will change and your action will change automatically as well. Definitely, there's, there's big pressure on unlearning and relearning and taking in yeah. what is already there, but you've never had access to learning that and you've just seen these structures in one way. So it's what you've highlighted is incredibly important. Um, so I'm just going to give you Jane guys... Oh, sorry, go on, Keza. I just need to watch Jane earlier. I think that I generally I don't I, I don't talk to white people about race anymore like I think that is um fused, unless they're paying me if you're paying me I have time to sit down and to talk to you and to do these um sessions and workshops and things like that because you're paying for my labor no longer will I do things or have those conversations because I have an emotional interest 
um, in, in making these changes because it's not enough. It's not enough just to have the conversation. It's, t it's time for them to invest. It's time for also white people who do get it and do understand that there is a system of white supremacy to speak to other white people about it and stop relying on black people to have that conversation. That was it. Um, I'm just going to, because we really don't have much time left, so I'm going to give you guys the last two questions just at the same time. <coughs> so first up is, other than hair discrimination, what do you think are the biggest structural barriers in place for black women in the UK? And second question is, how has patriarchy within the black community impacted the role and place of black women in activism and society? Um, I don't know, I, I don't want to be rude, but again, maybe we could ask who's answering the question because I feel like as a black woman, most black women know what they're going through, you know, in the systems at play. But then also I think we live in the age of information. There's so much reports out there. There's so much things documenting the experiences of black people globally that I just feel like, why would we need to spell it out? I don't know. I just feel like we a lot of us do know there's a lot of things that have been spoken about i am even mentioned about the domestic violence issue of black women and you didn't mention that you know, you've just put on the hair and for hair for black people actually that is very important i feel like the way that the question was very was framed it was a sift that oh it's a bit dismissive when actually for hair it's our culture it's our heritage there's so much attached to it and actually a lot of us um don't feel as though we can be professional if we are ourselves and that is a big issue and it may, it may not be a big issue for you but for black women who spend so much money on hair and the whole concept of hair is actually quite a big thing for us and I think um yeah I don't know I just feel like the conversation does seem like the person could really just go and google the age of information as we spoke about what labor needs to be done and I feel like it's just feeling I don't know I just feel like it, it's lacking a bit of depth for me as if I just said, I think a lot, we've spoken about a lot of things today. So I think perhaps, I, I mean, I don't know when that question was posed, but you got a lot of your answers today um, during this panel. Um, and Google is definitely your friend. I found it interesting just having this discussion because I had a discussion about feminism and black female activism and yet what I'm hearing is discussions, just as we had discussions in the 70s and 80s, that have focused on the issues within our communities and how they affect us as black women. Mm -hmm. So I think those issues will continue to come to the fore. Issues like police brutality, issues like what's happening to our youth, mm -hmm. issues like the failure of the education system, issues mm -hmm. like the prison system, and all those other things that have come into the mix as we've been talking. Mm -hmm. But um, I do feel it's a valid question because um, I believe that it's very easy. I don't know whether it's because I travel backwards and forwards to Ghana and quite often get called, a, which is another word for white woman, which actually refers to our westernization more than our skin color. I'm constantly reminded that um, there are issues that are life and death issues in our communities back there that are not being brought to the fore and which I think as black here in this country with the privilege that we have um, we could probably um, be, be creating far more focus on I'm talking about FGM and I'm not saying this work isn't being done don't get me wrong but I'm saying, you know, the question was what are the issues of black women today? I think those in issues... The UK, in the UK, she right. said she said in, in the UK. In the, the UK. Person said in the UK. Sorry, Ife? The person said in the UK. The person is in the UK. No, the, the person said the question the is the person. Oh, the issues in the UK. Uh, yeah, we have the privilege to raise these issues just as we were able to um, have an impact on the apartheid by the actions we took here in the UK. I do believe that there's things that we could do here using our power, using our economic power using our voice, using our access to technology to raise these issues on behalf of those who are voiceless or who don't have the, the position of privilege that we do. So I think that's part of what into our discussion. Um, and it needs to be um, discussions about sex trafficking, about the women whose bodies are lying at the bottom of the and the English Channel, black women from Africa 
who have made that journey have not made it far enough. Um, those are just as much issues for us here in the UK, I believe, as the other more immediate issues that affect us and our communities here. I think we need to join it up. And I think we recognize that because we have a voice, we are duty bound really to speak out on behalf of those who perhaps don't. And I don't mean that in a patronizing way. I mean, drawing on their experience to shed a light on those um, injustices, those inequalities and those atrocities need to be done in the name of, I don't know, progress. And just the, to go to that second question, uh, which was how has patriarchy within black community impacted the role and place of black women in activism and society? That's a heavy question. It's a heavy <laughs> question. I'm really exhausted just thinking about the way that, um, yeah, men and just the patriarchy as a general thing, because it's not just men who perpetuate it, just to be clear. Um, uh, there are certain spaces I don't go to within the movement. I'm an, an activist and I've been um, in the BLM space for quite a few years now. And um, there are certain spaces I just don't go to because it's distracting from the work that I need to do. And the fact that um, I'm an unmarried woman and, oh, where's your husband? It's like, do we really have to talk about where my husband is or if, it, if I have a husband or want one? Is that important to black people, whether I'm married or not, really? So it's, um, it's exhausting. And also people try to talk over you. Um, you and a lot of situations I don't feel safe in because I'm also a queer black woman. So then there's that part. So yeah, it's, um, it takes away from the aims of the work, which is about helping black people, about helping black young people, about creating opportunities for black people. And I think that for me, I avoid certain situations so I can stay focused on the work rather than um, on people like trying to derail me into conversations that have no relevance in that space. I'm just reminded when I am thinking back historically to some of our earlier efforts to organize, um, very depressing it was to encounter the attitudes that you're talking about, Kaiser, even back then. But I'm also reminded that there were brothers who manned the creche while we got on with the business, with the work that we were doing, mm -hmm. and who, you know, stood behind and um, sold the books so that we could get on and do our work and I think it's important that where it's possible to challenge patriarchal attitudes and where it's possible to identify potential allies mm. their background whatever their gender we should be trying to to do that because division has got us nowhere mm -hmm. and um, I in patriarchal men in my own family who you know um, possibly would be dismissed by many of the feminists I know but for me to sit down to have the arguments with them to sit and chat and to try to persuade them that their their thinking um, needs to change and I think that's part of our work as well uh, if I just if you have anything to add I'm that just thinking before. about loads of different things um well, thinking of loads of different things, um, but I think a, a recent encounter um, that reminded me particularly of patriarchy on Twitter was when I was speaking about particularly colorism in the black community in the UK, and I was saying that often what we what we find is that um, black men sometimes use colorism as a way to divide black women, and because of the preference and stuff like that and I was bringing it, I was bringing it up as an issue within the black community um, and this preference of lighter skinned women and then a, a black guy on Twitter accused me of dividing the race the same sort of narrative that oh why am I doing that I'm dividing the race and why am I bringing that up and um, there's a lot of things going on and actually there's some black women that have been rude to me as well and he started going into some talk about angry black women and you know I just felt as though a lot of things that 
concern black women, particularly things that we find important, like, you know, in terms of, you know, black women having to bleach because they feel excluded or things that, things that are important to us are sidelined and they're not seen as important. And even when black women are perpetuating those things, it's, it's just dismissed. There's a, there's a black woman who um, called out this guy called Talib Kikwib. I think that's he's a, he's, a, he's a rapper in America. He's meant to be quite conscious about um, a lot of um, rappers having light-skinned women. And for the past... Um, almost coming to I think a month now he's been harassing her they had to ban him off Twitter um, and he's been harassing her on Instagram sending all his followers he's like over a million followers on her and you know a lot of that people in that community have been quite silent about it so when we bring up stuff about colorism or things that um, black men do that are affecting us as um, people within the black community we are dismissed I find that quite often so I think until our issues become as important and you know the same way black women we'll talk about police brutality even though it affects black men more than it affects black women even though it does affect black women disproportionately until we have that balance in terms of black women's issues um, being seen in the same level as, as black men's issues we're going to always have this sort of patriarchy seeping into, into all that we do so I think um, the fact that our issues are dismissed is just a reflection of society and, and how we are dismissed in general um, so I think it's, it, it, it may just be having to as, as Stella said being patient having discussions with those men, even though they're difficult, I mean, having discussions, trying to get them to understand where their mindset's coming from, why they think like this, and trying to, to break them out of it. But I'm also mindful that that's free labour and emotional labour, but some women don't want to do that, and it's traumatic for them as well. So I understand that too. So I think it, the onus is on people that are doing the oppressing to stop doing that, isn't it, I guess? Um, so I guess it's uh, getting them to a stage where they are ready to unlearn um, and to be much more understanding of issues that black women are facing. Definitely. Um, and I think what you've, what you've said, and it's the issues of black women are just as important and they need to be made that way. And that was the whole point of us having this discussion today. It was something that we wanted to flag. So in many ways, um, it was a heavy question to end on, but I'm glad it also came up because I think it was necessary. Um, but we're going to end there for this evening. And I just want to start by thanking Ify Keza and Stella for taking part in this and Thank you for being so frank and so honest and for, for the, a very enlightening discussion. And to all the people who've participated, thank you very much as well for joining us this evening. And we hope that there's some things like a lot that you can take from this to reflect on and to take forward into your own practices, into your daily lives, into the, the activism that you do. And yes, thank you for being here. Um, I guess, Amy, if there's anything that you wanted to add before we close the discussion, that would be great. If you're still there. No, no, just so a thanks from Amy and also thank you to new, new uh, to the, the meeting house for inviting us as well to do this event today. So thank you so much, everyone.